I mean, pretty much everything's handmade to a certain extent. I mean, amps generally aren't made um, automated. Most of our hand-wired amps are very handmade. It takes a lot of hours to make these amps. And anyone that thinks otherwise is crazy. I don't really feel like handmade is super important. Quality is more important than how it gets made. I think it means whatever the marketing department wants it to mean. Handmade implies that it's made better. And I tend to agree. Um, machines can do a lot of stuff better than people, maybe assembling circuit boards, things like that. Uh, handmade is more costly, and you hope that there's somebody in charge that watches what's being handmade. Everything's handmade. There's a hand that gets involved somehow. Somebody's going to package it. It's going to go along. I mean, much like Democrat or Republican, I throw away the labels that are associated with a product and just look at the content, right? If it sounds good, it is good. If it doesn't sound good, it doesn't sound good. I feel like anything with a good process, good quality control, uh, machine help can make a better product than handmade, but handmade can be a fantastic product as well. I don't think there's a right or a wrong or a good or a bad. It's how you execute either one. Uh, we do hand make some of our prototypes and I can tell you that those handmade prototypes are not good quality. Those that are machine made are significantly higher quality. So I think that when it comes to a very complicated uh, multi-processor effects pedal, I think there's no way to make such a thing handmade at high quality. There's a couple ways to view that. Our stuff is all made in China. The only the advantage you get from mass produce is the cost. We're able to make the Armageddon amp, for example, that's got all the features of any other $5,000 amp and the tone. There's no secret to getting a good sound, uh, but it's made more efficiently in China. Uh, you don't have now. Keep in mind, in in other countries, you don't have to use crappy parts. You can specify parts, you can ship stuff, so the thing you're saving on is, assembly, is labor. Yes. And you hate to do that to your own country, but people can't afford things, and that's the way to make it affordable. Uh, and for manufacturing, every dollar that we spend in manufacturing ends up costing the customer almost four bucks, right? Made in the USA, you know, if this was, if, if an amp was made in China or Korea, but the manufacturer was more concerned about spending that dollar on producing the best possible product that they could versus creating a bunch of features and, and lights and things that will make the product easier to sell in a brochure, you know, then I don't care where it's made. I mean, I, there's plenty of things made in the USA, um, guitars, guitar amps, pedals, that are just absolute crap. And, and I don't think that um, just because something's made here or made someplace else should determine it. Let it live on its own worth if it sounds good or it is good. You have to define what made in the USA means. I think your product has to be, uh, all the components in your product have to be made in the USA to be classified as a product made in the USA. So pretty much in electronics there are no components such as capacitors, resistors and stuff anymore that are made in the US. You can't really say made in USA. You can say assembled in USA. Uh, because it's made from really parts all over the world. I personally think it's cool to make things in the USA, um, but it depends. I mean, some, some, some things are made in the USA and they're not necessarily super good, and other things are. I think it just it depends on the specific product and the spe spe specific company. I think that one is important. I mean, it's important to me when, when I can do that. Um, just because, you know, then you, you get a sense that like the people who made it weren't working in a sweatshop. It's more of a human rights issue to me than uh, any, any sort of national pride. Uh, to me, made in the USA is really important. Uh, no doubt you can make great things everywhere. My iPhone's probably made in Bangladesh or something, I don't know. Uh, but I like to employ people, you know. JHS is around 25 employees, we're in Kansas City. 
And to me, that means a lot. And I try to use parts and help and outsource stuff in the U.S. because I care about the economy. So to me, it's important. And as much as I'd like to build them and have them in Massachusetts because there's enormous advantages of proximity, those places don't exist really at any price. We will need to go where high quality electronic manufacturing is in order to deliver a reasonably priced um, and high quality long lasting effects pedal because that's what our customers are demanding from us. Uh, so again, I feel that it's extremely important. This came up a lot in the previous elements of my, of my, my job, uh, my, my, my career, where it was like, what would happen if we didn't make these things in the United States? And in that case, I mean, it's a brand killer because you have these legacy products that were made here, designed here, built here. You move that to China, it's like, it's dead. I don't even, I don't even want it anymore, you know? Uh, because no, none, nothing that made it cool in the first place you know, it's still intact. So it's very product product dependent. It's very much dependent on the brand, how the company was built, and the legacy that's associated with it. A while it changed. Our first product back in 1968 was the LP1 Power Booster. And it was just one transistor and it ushered in the age of overdrive. All the amplifiers in those days, you turn them up to 10 and they'd be clean. This made it a lot louder and, 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 and gave overdrive to the amps. At the, the trade shows then were in the hotel rooms in Chicago and uh, Hartley Peavy tells a story at a lot of his tours, how he saw a long line of people waiting to hear uh, this demo by some guy with long hair and he finally came in and he, he, he bought one of these things and it made the amp loud and then when he opened it up he was amazed that he had one transistor and he, he stuck that into one of his next amp designs and that, uh, and that was his first amp with overdrive and his first big successful amp. Of course in those days everything was analog. Now we still bring out new analog products but with digital there's all sorts of new things you can do. Like our our 9 series, those are all digital. You couldn't do those with analog. I mean, uh, and then we, we, you know, like our Ravish sitar uh, synthesizer, you play guitar and sound like a, like you're playing a sitar. You, you, you have to use, do, that can only be done digital. So the music, the ch music's changed in that way. Of course, now a lot of people are trying to put things through with iPhones and iPads. We're not, we're not into that. Although we did bring out an app for our old mini synthesizer that we had in the 70s. That has some wonderful rich sounds. Uh, and they, uh, we added uh, MIDI, and you could buy that app for only $2.99 for your phone or $4.99 for your iPad. and you go ahead and buy one and have fun. Rock and roll. Well, I think that you're going to see more and more awesome d digital s stuff. I'm, I'm hoping, and I, I think there will always be a p place for uh, analog effects, because um, I, I love analog effects for lots of different reasons. But uh, I mean, the technology is just going to get more and more advanced. I think we're going to see a lot of companies come and go. Um, I think we're still seeing a lot of great innovation on on a lot of levels. What I hope to see is uh, a lot more integration with different instruments and different styles of music. I think I see that in some popular music and a lot of underground stuff. Historically, a lot of musical changes have stemmed from technological changes. I guess I'm optimistic. I mean, I hope to see it still blooming in the future. Um, it's kind of had a little bit of a dark day uh, in as far as guitar goes and, and amps, but I kind of see it sort of coming back a little bit. Uh, I see a lot of young people starting to play again, and I, I, I get a lot of young clients that come through the booth and they're playing, they're playing great, and you know they're really digging back to kind of the old roots. 
and you know their favorite bands are like such as Led Zeppelin and different things like that. And I think that's really great. You know, it's everything cyclical. Everything comes back in and again. Uh, I remember when I was going to school and they told me, you know, oh, here are vacuum tubes, but most of you will never ever see one. As things went to solid state and as we started adding chorus to guitar amplifiers and I got the delay built in, all I have to do is press this button and then digital modeling and then, I, you know, I think everything comes back to full circle. It's uh, with some of the artists that I deal with that are coming out of uh, modeling backgrounds into a, a, a tube amp for the first time, maybe, and um, just going, oh, the responsiveness, the difference, the connection is there. So I think that as the industry, it'll continue to run in circles, we'll continue to chase the next shiny item, but I think the fundamental things will always be the fundamental things. If it sounds good, it is good. Hard to predict. Uh, you know, what we thought would happen five or ten years. We thought two amps would be gone by now. And boy, did that change. As far as like my world and guitar amps and stuff, I think it'll be around for a while. Uh, there's a lot of big companies banking on that. They're not bailing, so I think as far as the tube amp world, I think we'll be okay for a while. Where I hope it goes is that I hope that the music industry, music gear uh, industry as a whole becomes more accepting of technology. I think the, the gear industry uh, tends to focus a lot on vintage gear, like the way stuff used to be built. And I, it looks to me like slowly that's changing. Slowly it's becoming more accepting of newer technology. I hope that trend continues because that's what we do. And uh, in the products that we do now and in the future are gonna reflect that. Uh, I see the pedal industry becoming less cluttered. I think that higher quality brands and people that innovate, I think they're starting to really step it up. And I think we've seen a real like oversaturation. Uh, and I think we're gonna start seeing a lot of separation in, you know, more DIY stuff like I started in and then more professional quality, maybe more like the 80s felt, you know, like more separation there. Well, I think just like um, the internet, mobile connectivity, and uh, things like that have impacted all kinds of, of applications. The connected world, you know, is having and will continue to have a dramatic impact on how people are creating their sounds and sharing the sounds that they have created using effects. Sort of my main focus right now is synthesizer style integration. We're opening up a lot of control voltage options, which is an old technology, but it's kind of coming back into vogue and um, having access to that. The big thing is digital signal processing. That opens up a lot of a lot of avenues that you, that you just can't do in analog. Yeah, I I don't so much know that. I ever, or anyone that works with me, uh, and in our R&D and in our marketing, I don't know. I don't know if we're trying to like push limits per se. We just try to do what we want to do and have fun, and we want to do that in a way where we make sure other people can have fun with it too. I want to make sure what I'm doing is what I want to do, but I also want to bring people along for the ride. So I wouldn't say like I'm trying to push limits. I'm just trying to have fun and bring people along with us. It's not really about using new technology as, as much as it's bringing back old technology and forgotten arts almost. A lot of what once was is being recreated now because it's been lost almost. And I think that's in a lot of, a lot of things are lost. I mean architecture even and, and craftsmanship and stuff has been lost over the years and there's not the same craftsman that there used to be. So we're kind of trying to bring that back. I mean, I've always been interested in exploring new sonic t territory, so I, I'm, I don't ever want to release stuff that's just really s similar to other stuff on the market. And um, 
I mean, technology is useful to that, especially with the digital control of analog technology. You can, you can kind of do anything. Well, not anything, but you can do a lot of stuff. So uh, I'm excited about the future and, and, and you know, continuing to push the limits, I guess. Change for change, um, or can be wasted energy. Part of my brand and my ability is just warring against the more is better, you know, make something sound really, really good. Make, just, you know, give players a path to, um, just to just a good solid uh, base of tonality that you know that they can put their pedal platform on that they can you know they can explore all these different sonic um, areas but you know for me more than anything is it's the bringing people back to center in that and true to the old um, is pushing forward the next generation what's always challenging with an effect pedal is how do you make it easy to use and intuitive, yet put the hooks into it so that deep editing is a possibility? One of the, the key things that we've used for this is the development of uh, applications running on iOS and on Android that allow you to easily and quickly connect to your pedal and do deep editing of parameters, which in a sense is like adding 200 knobs to a simple pedal. I think that that's uh, you know one of the, the the you know the the key things. And then again, the interconnectivity that I've been speaking of, and the ability to share the work that you created with those 200 knobs, and then be able to store it in the cloud. Oddly enough, there are no new ideas. Some of the circuits that I use, some of the overdrive sounds that I have in my amps, I did 30 years ago for people. It's tube technology and it's, it's already, it was mature 30 years ago. It's kind of like, how much can you do with that? Personally, when I do a new product or whatever, one of the things that I do is, is kind of look at it, it's my concept on life. Why am I going to do this? What's going to make this thing that I want to make better or different than everything else. So I try to come up with either a feature or something. It's hard to make a new sound. Guitar players are kind of stuck on what they want. It's either a Marshall, a Fender, or a Vox, and it's either got more gain or less gain. There's not a lot you can do other than tweaking it for personal taste. You know, we're all chasing something new and different and the, 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 the sound in our heads, you know, trying to trying to pin that down and and that evolves over time. So, you know, we're always going to be chasing something new and different. And uh, so that's why we're always a, a, trying to acquire a new piece of gear to do that. So when you talk about gas acquisition, I think, I think there are more people that need to be learning how to play songs all the way through. Uh, somebody asked me um, to describe Nam to them, and it's a hundred drummers playing a hundred different songs, a hundred bass players playing a hundred different songs, and a hundred guitar players playing the same song. Yeah, but it just goes wheedly, 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 wheedly. So it's, you know, it, it's crazy for me that just, I, I, you know, guys that worry about acquiring more gear are the same guys that learn licks instead of learn complete songs. You know, these are matters of the heart, you know, we're artists and so we're always looking for something new, some new way to express ourselves, some, you know, another guitar, you know, and it's not just about, hey, if I had that other guitar, I'd be able to do this. Sometimes you pick up another instrument, you plug into a different pedal, you plug into a different amp, and you're writing a different song. And so there are times when an, a gear purchase might look extremely silly because you say, but you have one of those already. And you're like, no, no, I, I do, but I don't have that one. And there's, there's, a, there's very much a sense of legitimacy to that if you'll give yourself over to it because it really does influence our creative process. An obsessive personality, I guess. Um, I can't speak for that person. I wonder if I am that person. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what drives that person. I'm sure they're like that with everything. 
not just music stuff, but anything they do, I'm sure that person gets tired of their car every two years and has to do something, or their skis or their motorcycle or whatever they do. I think it's a personality thing as opposed to something specific to music. It's fun, it's fun to get a new thing that makes cool sounds. And, um, you know, you always want to try something in your rig with, you know, your guitar and your amp and stuff. So um, it's just exciting to try new things and, and it, it's fun. Oh, that's, a, that's an endless, endless, endless thing. Um, Guitar players, generally speaking, always want the next best thing, or they they're they're always searching for what their tone is. Um, occasionally, uh, they had it, and they go past it, and they should really go back to it. You already had your tone, and that's what you probably should have stuck with, because that was unique to you. And uh, sometimes your search is driving you to mediocrity. That's another one I don't, you know, it's like, I, I think we're a boutique company, I guess, I don't really know. Um, I don't know what the definition is. You know, it, it, I think that uh, it's just a word that, that has taken on a, a different definition, uh, so much so that, that I'm not sure what it is anymore. Actually, I don't know that it has. Um, one of the, some of the boutique used to mean a guy or a couple of people sat there and hand assembled stuff and all that kind of thing and it took them eight hours to make an amp and all that. For example, Friedman is still a high-end boutique brand, but they're hand built by a group of people that sit and physically hand build them. So I don't know that it's changed. I think it's grown because the demand has grown for the, the boutique companies to make more stuff. Oh, I think that's another word that now means nothing. Yeah. It's a word that gets thrown around. It, it doesn't actually mean anything anymore. How has it changed? I don't know if it has it changed. Hmm. I'm, I'm not so sure it's changed. Maybe for us it's changed a little bit, meaning that we're kind of growing past boutique at this point. Um, it, we're not that small anymore. Now it's we're a little bit more mainstream. We're a little bit more out there in the world. I don't know if Boutique has really changed. It's been around a long time, and uh, it's just that sometimes the companies get bigger than, than the Boutique brand, so to speak. Yeah, it's a very tiring word. It's a word that doesn't mean anything anymore to me. Uh, boutique has turned into a forum word that is usually associated with very long wait times, very high prices, and sometimes very bad customer service or customer experiences. So I don't even say JHS is boutique. I just want to say JHS makes good products. We're nice to our customers and we stand behind what we build for all of our lives and the life of the product. If boutique means that, I'll be boutique. But if boutique means something other than that, other than a great customer experience, a nice product that lasts, I don't want to be associated with it. Right, and so when you talk about boutique, you know, boutique being a small shop, small industry, I mean, in the whole, when you look at, you know, a company like me, and, and I think we're one of the, um, you know, more successful brands, we still represent less than 1% of the overall, like, the guitar amps sold in the world, like way less than 1%. And so I, I think, you know, once you stay within that, that confine and small and I don't think necessarily that boutique lends itself to uh, mean that anything's going to be better quality. It just going to, it means it's going to be in smaller volume. And again, if it sounds good, it is good. If you like that Squire Strat, man, rock that thing. When someone says boutique, what I think of is a couple of guys in a shop, you know, hand assembling products one at a time. Um, and a lot of people in the industry who either call themselves boutique or are labeled as boutique do not fit that. So it's hard for me to say exactly what boutique means in this industry. Um, I guess if anything, it means 
um, smaller companies that focus more on making quality products that sound good or fit a certain niche market rather than being mass produced to a very wide audience by a larger company. Well, I think that when we talk about brand new designs, we really, there, I mean, let's be honest, there's really not a whole lot of brand new designs. There are a bunch of people that are taking existing designs and tweaking this or that or the other thing, or maybe mixing one with another, or adding a feature here or there. Um, they're not really pushing technology forward. The companies that really are, are doing that are, are the ones that are making, like, uh, you know, working with the, the new digital technology, making things that, you know, attack the signal differently. Guitar, or, uh, guitar players are interesting people because, you know, we, we still use technology that's like, you know, super old because we like it and it sounds good. So I think, you know, it's a balance. Um, I love the old stuff, but I like new stuff as well. So it's just, you know, trying to find what works for you specifically? Well, when it's tube stuff, I don't know there's a such thing as a new design. So the guys that are the players that prefer that also prefer Stratocasters and Telecasters and Les Pauls, and they don't want to look at new guitar technology either. They won't play an amp with a Class D solid state power amp in it. So I think there's just that person. And then there's the other group that'll try anything new. Um, and they'll do the the Kempers and the all the you know the new technology and people are open. So I think you just have two two different groups of people and they they cross over once in a while and very often they come back to what they were comfortable with. Uh, it's both. They say they want new designs, but we all just want to play a tube screamer. You know, me and Brian joke about that. No, but I think it's both. You know, we'll do the color box. You know, we've done that highly highly unique. But at the same time, we're going to do the moonshine. It's a tube screamer. Uh, they want both. I think people want more of the classic because it's familiar. It's like I wear black t-shirts all the time in the same pair of jeans for like 10 years because I know it. You're going to want to play an analog delay and a tube screamer because you know it. But you kind of want to buy that shirt that's different, but you might not ever wear it. I think that's how it is. When I started back in 1968, there was yeah, maybe two or three competitors in the industry. Uh, there was a Maestro Fuzz Tone, there was some tape echo units, uh, but now there's a, like maybe a thousand guys building pedals and selling them. So, of course, the more you have, the, uh, some percentage of them be creative, come up with something novel, also keeps you on your toes, and then out of those, evolve out of those boutique companies, evolve uh, companies that are, uh, are more than boutique like you, Wampler, and Earthquaker, and uh, you know, uh, uh, Strymon, uh, and uh, so it's competition, and we, uh, we're into business, so we want to compete, and we want to we win. We want to make electromonics great again. <laughs>